with us online, whether live or whether you're watching uh, later in the week. Uh, we hope that everyone gets something uh, on today's service. For those who don't know me, my name is Michael Yule. I'm an elder here in St. Blaine's, and this service is part of my worship leadership training. So I hope you all uh, enjoy the service and enjoy what God has to say to us this morning. Our call to worship comes from the book of Revelation. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Our first hymn is from Mission Praise, uh, number 451, uh, Love Came Down at Christmas. Now, I know this is a Christmas carol normally, but today's service is about abounding in love. And at Christmas time, we saw just how great God's love is for us when he sent his Savior, his Son, to be our Savior. So, a mission praise 451, Love Came Down at Christmas. Let's come before the God of love. Let's pray. We're drawing in the words of Psalm 145. We exalt and praise you, our God the King. We will praise your name forever and ever. Every day we will praise you. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And from generation to generation, people praise you and all that you have done. They tell of the power of your awesome works and proclaim your great deeds. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. All your works praise you, Lord, as do we, your faithful people. We praise the fact that your kingdom is everlasting and your dominion endures through all generations. Yahweh, you are faithful in all you do and you uphold all who fall and lift up all who are bowed down by worry, particularly in these difficult days when we are assailed by health worries, financial worries and the failings of leadership in the country. We thank and praise you, O Lord, that you are righteous and faithful and near to all who call on you. We thank you, Father, that you are a good Father, abounding in love, a love that led to your Son being born at the time we now call Christmas. We so thank you for your divine love, not that we have loved you, but that you love us and sent your Son to be the propitiation of our sins. 
we are only too aware of our shortcomings, Lord. Where you are faithful, we are unfaithful to your commands, unfaithful to your love, and undeserving of your grace and mercy. But we are amazed, Lord, that despite our failings, despite our rebellious natures, your love sent us your only Son, the perfect atoning sacrifice, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that your character is one of love. You are the epitome of love, and in Jesus Christ, your love is revealed. Forgive us our failings, Lord, our lack of love, and hear us as we pray together in the words our Savior taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the point um, where I now call everyone all age because I'm talking maybe primarily to those of a, a younger age group, but I guess we have all have a, a young disposition. Um, and so the talk is really for everyone. Today's service is about love. And that word is used in many, many ways and not always in the right way. For example, we talk about loving things, loving things we do, loving things we eat. And I have a visual aid. For me, I just love this particular brand of dark chocolate caramel wafer. Um, and I'm sure people here and people watching online will have things like that that they love. But is it really love? Does it not really mean I really like eating a dark chocolate caramel wafer? And of course, other brands are available. People love sport. I know that there are people in church who love football, who love golf. I particularly love curling. Um, and a wee plug, uh, next week the Winter Olympics start, and uh, curling is a big feature of that. And Scotland is well represented there with three teams, a men's team, a ladies' team, both of which are the current European champions, and a mixed doubles team of two, and they're the current world champions. So I love curling and I love watching it. Or I really enjoy curling and I really enjoy watching it. Some people love running. And I want to talk briefly this morning about a man who did love running and who was very good at it. This article appeared uh, in a newspaper not that long ago about Eric Little being inducted into Scottish Rugby's Hall of Fame. And he was being inducted because he had won seven caps for playing rugby for Scotland. But Eric Little is perhaps better known as a runner. Uh, he was a very good runner um, and you know, he loved running. And in the film Chariots of Fire, you see his sister sort of saying, Eric, do you think you really should be running quite so much? And he says, well, it's a gift from God. I love running and when I run well, I feel God's pleasure. And his story culminated in 1924 at the Paris Olympics when Eric was selected to run for Great Britain. And he was going to run in the 100 yards. And today we'd probably have called him a shoe-in for the gold medal. But Eric discovered that the 100 yards final was to be run on a Sunday. And the great thing about Eric was, although he loved running and although he loved his country, he loved God more. And he had to go to the, the people who led the British team and say, sorry, I can't run on Sunday. It's not right. I'm going to go to church. Well, you can imagine the consternation that that caused amongst the people organizing the team. Their shoe-in for the gold medal wasn't going to run. A lot of changes went on. And Eric eventually ran in what today would be the 400 meters and what then was the 440 yards. And in the changing room, uh, in uh, getting ready for the race and the film portrays one of the American athletes handing him a bit of paper and on that bit of paper was written he that honours me I will honour and it's a quote from 1 Samuel chapter 2 at verse 3 Eric went on to win that race and win gold 
uh, for Great Britain. Not because he was the best, but because he loved God, and God honored him that day. So when we think of loving something, think of Eric Little, and think of just how much he loved God. He put God first in all that he did. He loved God. Let's uh, now sing a a hymn uh, from Mission Praise. It's 139, and it is all about loving God. It's, Father, we adore you. And it goes on, um, Jesus, we adore you, and Spirit, we adore you. So Mission Praise 139, Father, we adore you. first reading today is from Ezekiel chapter 34, reading from verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, Clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. <coughs> Excuse me. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. (coughs) Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will be no longer be food for them. <coughs> for the, <coughs> excuse me. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flocks when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. 
I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements of the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. <coughs> and in verse 30, then they will know that I am the Lord their God and am with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. And our second reading is from 1 John chapter 4, reading from verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might ha live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to have one, love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us, because he has, the Spirit, has given us of his Spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Excuse me. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because God, <coughs> sorry, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Thank you, Michael. Let's sing to God's um, praise again. Uh, hymn number 449 from Mission Praise, uh, Love Divine. When in the past we've sung this hymn, Michael, our organist, has usually played it to the tune Blainworm, and I've kept saying to him, could you please play it to Hifferdal, because I think it's a better tune. And it was the tune that we sang this hymn to at our wedding. So today we're <laughs> singing it to Hifferdal. So thanks, Mike. Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a well-used phrase, three little words, and it's usually used to refer to the phrase, I love you. My text today is three little words, not I love you, though as brothers and sisters in Christ, obviously I do. My phrase today is abounding in love. The phrase is taken from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, a verse where Yahweh sets out his characteristics to Moses. The Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Every time I read that verse, I get excited. Here is our God describing his characteristics. And how wonderful they are, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Our God's love is not a sloppy, wishy-washy love. It is a strong, robust, tender love a love that seeks our love and our obedience in return for his blessings. It's a love that cannot let the guilty, the unrepentant, those who deny our Lord and serve earthly masters go unpunished. A love that provides the way to salvation through the Lord's Son, Jesus Christ. This is the God who created us in his own image. So these characteristics should be in us too. We should be capable of all of the above if we are true to our God. When I think about this verse, I reflect on how well, or rather how poorly, I reflect these traits in my life. And perhaps that's something we should all do. It's something Yahweh would have us do. So today, I want to explore with you abounding in love, this key part of our God's holy nature and what it should mean for us in our daily lives. Indeed, this short phrase, these three little words, arguably is at the center of all the traits listed in the verse from Exodus. Without love, can there be compassion, grace, or forgiveness? Without such love, how could our holy God leave the guilty unpunished? Now, there are very many instances of God showing his abounding love in the Bible, in both Old and New Testaments. And our scripture readings are just two examples for us to consider, to reflect on, and to take to heart. Ezekiel was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, and perhaps along with Isaiah and Jeremiah, one of the better known. He lived at a time of international upheaval. The Babylonian Empire was sweeping all before it. It had all but destroyed the power of Egypt and had then turned its attention to the kingdom of Judah, who had initially allied themselves to Babylon despite the warnings of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. Subsequent rebellion by Judah against Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was subdued quickly and in 597 BC, the first exile of Jews from Jerusalem to Babylon took place, and Ezekiel was among those exiles. What must it have been like for this once proud people? They had been turned out of their homes by a pagan king. Where was Yahweh in all this? What thoughts went through their minds on the long trek from Jerusalem to Babylon? And what was it like for them when they got there? Today, we have TV coverage, newspapers, and social media to inform us minute by minute. We are bombarded every hour of the day with the latest news and pictures. I guess we're all familiar with images of bombed out cities, of exhausted and starving people, of folk of all ages risking life and limb 
to escape war, oppression, and famine, to get a better, safer life for themselves. So think of the exiled Judahites, cast out from their fine houses and palaces in Jerusalem to a tented village in Babylon. Where was the love of God in all this? What had they done to deserve this treatment would be going through their minds, the why me attitude. They had what the commentator David Strain calls a God problem. Their sinful life had been easy and comfortable and it had been taken from them by God. Why? Well, this was the environment that Ezekiel found himself in and called by God to prophesy to these people. His first task was to make the exiles see that they fully justified God's judgment upon them and to get them to repent, to turn back to the God who loves them and craves their love in return, a situation Jesus described so well in the parable of the prodigal son. As we've seen, Exodus 34, 6 ends with, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and God is faithful to his character. In his commentary on Ezekiel, Christopher Wright says, none of the other prophets surpassed Ezekiel in the depth and extent of his portrayal of sin in all its horror. Sin is an abomination. It is detestable. Sin offends God. And the end, it provokes Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, beyond all patience or pity. And if you think God acted hastily, if you think that Yahweh should have forgiven them, consider the past history of God's chosen people as told in the books of the Old Testament. Even in the immediate aftermath of the rescue from slavery and oppression in Egypt, in the desert they turned away from God. For hundreds of years, God's chosen people had rebelled against him, from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, eating the forbidden fruit, through to Ezekiel's time. And Yahweh had indeed been compassionate, slow to anger and forgiving. But enough was enough, and he acted in justice against this rebelling people. By the time of our Old Testament reading, Ezekiel had been prophesying for some eight years. Jerusalem had just fallen and been looted, pillaged, and destroyed. Ezekiel's ministry enters a new phase. Yahweh has inflicted his punishment on the guilty, and now he is to show his abounding love for his people, his flock. This prophecy starts with God's castigation of the shepherds of his people, the kings and leaders of both Israel and Judah who had not led the flock properly. Verse 4 is key. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. As a result of their failure, the shepherds, the Jewish leaders, are removed. God himself will rescue his flock. Verse 11, I myself will look for my sheep and look after them. Such is the love of Yahweh. He will seek out his flock. He will tend them. He will search for the lost and bring back strays. He will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. What wonderful words of love and compassion. One can only speculate how this message was received by the flock Ezekiel was speaking to. But the message of hope didn't end there. And in chapter 39 we can read, I will now restore the fortunes of Jacob and will have compassion on all the people of Israel and I will be zealous for my holy name. Have you been lost? Wandering alone in this world with all its sin and horror and wondering where you are? It's so wonderful to think that God, the creator God, cares so much that he will come looking for you. He will bring you back to the flock and into his glorious care. I was once lost. My faith was but a small flickering light, almost snuffed out. But praise be Yahweh found me, and through his earthly shepherds 
through Christian folk brought me back to the flock. And I'm so glad and thankful for Yahweh's grace, compassion, and abounding love. Of course, the concept of shepherding the flock is not confined to the Old Testament. In John's Gospel, we have the well-known teaching of Jesus about the Good Shepherd, the one who knows his flock and whose sheep know his voice and follow him. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The words of our call to worship come to mind. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus echoes the words of Ezekiel's prophecy. Indeed, he fulfills it as the Son of God come to shepherd the flock and, in an act of greatest love, to lay down his life for the flock, to lay down his life for you and for me. To save his sheep, the shepherd gave his life. Jesus told his disciples, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And my command is this, love one another as I have loved you. The Apostle John picks up this command in his first letter in the passage read this morning. John's point in this passage is crystal clear and deeply encouraging for all true believers. The God who is light and who has made his light shine in the world is the God who is love, who in Christ has made his love known among us. John extols the virtue of love because it comes from God. The God who told Moses all those years ago that he was abounding in love. And John supports that by referring to the ministry of Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God who came to die that we have life. In verse 10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And our response, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Mervyn Eloff in his commentary writes, those who are born of God and know God will love one another because God is love. It is because God is love that love comes from God. And those who know God love one another. The love of the invisible God is made visible in and through his Son sent into the world. And the well-known words of John's Gospel 3.16 are echoed by John again in his epistle at verse 16. God is love. The words of John, both in his gospel and in this letter, affirm the truth that God revealed to Moses, that he, Yahweh, the creator God, is all that he said he is, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. He does not leave the guilty unpunished, but he provides the means of redemption. Such is his love. We are created in the image of God, so we share these characteristics. But we fail so often to uphold our obligation to be like him. How often do we fail to show compassion, to be gracious to those we encounter, those who do not necessarily deserve our love, but in grace they have it. If you are walking in darkness, if you cannot clearly see the way ahead, then turn to the light. Turn to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whose love for you reveals the love of the Father. We don't deserve God's love, for we fail him. We disobey, we rebel, we sin. 
but the words of John at the beginning of his letter bring comfort. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. Fellowship with the God who is light is only possible because of the loving initiative of the God who is love. The God who in love sent his Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect atoning sacrifice. In Jesus, the God whose law condemns us, himself bears its penalty and secures our pardon. That once for all sacrifice that showed to the world, if only the world would but see it, that our God is abounding in love. Amen. Let's reflect on these words now. Uh, our organist, uh, Mike Nolan, not just our organist and choir master, he's also a composer. And Mike has composed another tune um, to the words of our first hymn, Love Came Down at Christmas. So for our reflection today, Mike's going to play uh, his tune and the words of the hymn hopefully will be on the screen for us to reflect. Mike. Thank you, Mike. Let's pray. <clears throat> God of love, God of light, we come to you with praise and thanksgiving for your abundant love, for your undeserved love, for your grace and undeserved mercy. How great thou art, wrote the poet, and how true those words are. And when we compare ourselves against the yardstick of your character, we see only too clearly how we fall short. But we thank you that our salvation is assured in Jesus Christ and that our journey following salvation is one of striving to be better, to be less rebellious, less self-centered and more aware of you and of the need to love one another as you love us. Father, we come to you and seek your forgiveness and in the quiet, we bring our individual concerns and feelings to you. Heavenly Father, we also bring our prayers to you for the wider world and for those brothers and sisters across the world who are less fortunate than ourselves. We pray that your Holy Spirit would strengthen and uphold those in need. We think of the difficulties and pressures on the ordinary folk in Afghanistan and Yemen, of the hungry and dispossessed. And we pray for all who try to bring relief to those in need. We think of those seeking a better life in this country facing a perilous journey to get here. And we pray for all who seek to help these people as they strive to make a new home for themselves. 
thinking especially of the work of Fourth Valley Welcome in our local area. We remember too the work of food banks across the country and in particular the work of, work of Startup Sterling helping those in need close to us. Father, we pray for the shepherds of this country, for our political leaders. We pray for wisdom and understanding of people's needs and for tolerance and respect for differing points of view. We pray they would lead the country in the right direction and be aware of the needs of all of the people, not just those who support them. We pray for all involved in the Church of Scotland as it seeks to restructure its ministry to take account of fewer members and reduced income. For leaders at national and local levels as they seek to find solutions to these temporal issues. May they hold strong to their faith in you and in your providence, Father, and be led by you and your love in the way of your kingdom. We pray for our Queen in this her Platinum Jubilee year. We thank you for her deep and committed faith and pray that it may help her to cope with the demands of her position, particularly the family issues she has to deal with just now. Father God, save and bless our Queen. And finally, Father, we would pray for each other in this community of believers. Help us to love one another, to be aware of the needs, the concerns, the worries of one another, and to respond to those needs where and whenever we can. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Good Shepherd, we bring these prayers to you. Amen. We come now to our final hymn from Mission Praise, uh, number 445. We've been talking about God is light and the light shining in the world. And this is the great Graham Kendrick hymn, uh, Shine Jesus, Shine is it's better known, but it's called Lord, the light of your love. Uh, Mission Praise, number 445.
To walk in the light is to know the compassionate love of God through Jesus Christ. So as we go from this place, let us walk in the light. Let us enjoy fellowship with one another and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.